welcome to the second video in my reed making series. Today, I'll show you how I go from gouged cane to shaped cane, and finally, to profiled cane. In my last video, I covered the following steps. Splitting, cutting to length, pre-gouging, using the arc filier, and gouging. We left off with letting the gouged cane dry for three days to see which pieces curl. We determined that the middle piece wasn't flat enough to fit in the shaper, so it was discarded. The next step is to do the sink float test. This is where I take the dried gouged cane and let it soak overnight, between 8 to 10 hours. The cane that sinks is more likely to be of better quality, and the floating pieces will be discarded. Depending on how much cane you want to shape, you may need a bigger basin than the small white container I've been using in this video. Here are the materials we'll need for shaping. A piece of gouged cane, an X-Acto knife, a shaper, a ruler, and a pencil. I purchased the X-Acto knife at Canadian Tire, and I use a copy of the Hertzberg shaper made by bassoon repair technician Ken Potzik in Atlanta. I'll take a soaked piece of cane that has sunk overnight and measure its length so that I can mark the midpoint. In my last video, I used the guillotine to cut the cane to 120 millimeters long, so the midpoint will be at 60 millimeters. Here is a picture of the gouged cane in the shaper. Here is a close-up. You can see that the midpoint marking on the piece of cane lines up with the V-shaped groove in the shaper. So you'll see here that because the shaper is curved, I can't go straight up and down. I have to aim for the narrowest point of the shape, which is about here. So I'll just use some slow strokes, bringing the blade towards me and back, and just trying to follow the contour of the shape. I'm going a little bit more quickly here, but if you're just starting out, you can take it a little bit slower. Now I'll flip it over, and do the same thing to this side. Make sure you have a nice sharp X-Acto knife so that it'll make the work much easier for you and have a smoother finish. I'll turn it over again and do the same thing to the other two sides. I see that there's still some extra cane here, so I'll go back and address that. So, here we are. The cane is now shaped. Now it's time to take the cane out of the shaper. With this stainless steel Hertzberg shaper, I can only loosen each handle a little bit at a time so that the mechanism doesn't get stuck. Here's a picture of the shaped cane. You can see how the shape flares out at the ends. If I've let the shaped cane dry at this stage, I'll need to soak it again for at least an hour before I can put it on the profiler. After the cane has been soaked, it is now ready for the profiler. The purpose of the profiler is to take the bark off of the cane to reveal the softer, more pliable material underneath. This profiler was made by Greg James, machinist of Precision Music Products Limited in Toronto. This equipment is unique because it acts as a kind of reed photocopier, using a motorized blade called a die grinder to remove material from gouged and shaped cane based off of a template. I'll talk about two different kinds of profiles at the end of this video. Here is a close-up of the piece of cane used as a template. Right now, I'm lowering the lever that operates a metal foot called a tracing rod, which glides over the template or guide piece while the profiler is running. Out of view is the handle that I use to pull, push, and rotate the barrel to cover the entire area that will be profiled. Now that I've demonstrated how the metal foot traces over the guide piece, 
I'll return it to its starting position so that it's ready to go when I plug in the machine. While still maintaining the same overall contour of the profile, I can increase or decrease its thickness, measured in hundredths of a millimeter, by rotating the graduated cylinder clockwise and counterclockwise respectively. I'm taking the piece of gouged and shaped cane and placing it underneath the loosened clamps on the barrel of the profiler underneath the blade. Next, I'll take the screwdriver that came with the machine and give between an eighth and a quarter turn. The cane should be securely in place without over-tightening the screws. Now it's time to plug in the motor that operates the blade. Right now, I'm lowering the presser foot, activating the motor, and lowering the lever that operates the tracing rod. I'll machine the collars first, and then smoothly guide the barrel so that the cutter can remove material in slim strips up and down the eventual blades of the reed. Since the cutter, which is the blade that removes material, moves in tandem with the tracing rod, the machine actually copies the contour of the template to the piece of gouged and shaped cane that needs to be profiled. I first rotate the barrel a quarter of a turn to the left so that it passes under the cutter from collar to collar. Then I'll make an eighth of a turn back to the right to integrate the work that I've done on the previous pass. The cane is now profiled. I'll take the brush that came with the profiler and wipe away the cane shavings. Then I'll loosen the screws that operate the clamps on the barrel. There are two kinds of profiles that I'll show you today. Compare these two pieces of gouged, shaped, and profiled cane. If we look at both under the light, the one on the right shows an even thickness throughout the blades of the reed, whereas the one on the left shows the cane getting thinner towards the tip and sides. Note the lightest areas, which are the thinnest parts of the profile. These will be removed once the reed is clipped, so I am only comparing the contours of the darker, thicker parts of each profile. When I turn the piece of gouged, shaped, and profiled cane into a reed, my goal is to use a file to smoothly taper the cane from the thickest point on the blade to the thinnest point. In the profile on the left, my profiler has already done most of this for me. This means that there is less work required because I don't have to remove as much cane, but it also means that I have to be more careful and refined as I target specific points on the reed to adjust. If you were just beginning to learn to make reeds, I would recommend using what I call the blank slate profile on the right, rather than the one with the side to center taper. Tune in next time to learn how to make a blank.